but let's open it up now uh, to anybody who's got thoughts, suggestions. You can ask a question or put your own point of view forward. A couple down the front here. Yeah, so um, um, it's Mark here. I I'm, uh, work at Paymark, Payment Switch New Zealand. Um, when I think of system thinking, I, I am a big fan of the work of John Seddon. Um, and one thing, I don't know where he got the statistic from, but he said that 95% of variation in employee performance is due to the system, variations in the system. And I'm just wondering, is that the role of the enterprise architects to manage the system and the variation as opposed to the employees? Where do, where do EAs fit into that? I think it was Deming who, who said the 95%. Uh, Seven draws on Deming a lot. Um, do you have yeah. any view on it? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, well, certainly the enterprise architects should be the ones who, who see this stuff like this, but well, we can't do everything in the company. There's a tendency for, for, for people to think that enterprise architects are these sort of magicians who, who just understand everything. Uh, to some degree we are, of course, but you know, uh, so, so I would say it's more like a business manager who should see stuff like that uh, in, in the organizational system in that sense. And, and that's what Seddon talks about. It's not, I, I have, well, I, frankly, I don't think he has a clue about IT systems. Um, but I don't know. Uh, but, but yes, the, the, the system thinking that, that Seddon talks about works very well for enterprise architects to take on. And, and every enterprise architect should at least read his system thinking in the public sector book, uh, for sure. But I would say there are actually other people in the enterprise who should be able to see this. We have the whole BPM, uh, and we have lean and, and all this um, process ownership and, and, and so on and so forth, which is more dedicated to understand the, the, the business performance. So enterprise architects should, should pr probably be those who aggregate stuff and see the bigger picture. Uh, I know we get into to sort of... Uh, uh, that, that, well, there's a lot of competition really on, on, on this. You mentioned on, on design thinking. Uh, we, we had a conference last week in Copenhagen. Is Milan in here? He was here. Uh, well, he's, uh, Milan Gunter, he's at the conference, he has a session tomorrow. Uh, and, and of course he talks about enterprise design. This conference we had was Intersection, uh, which is a perfect name for, for, for this uh, thinking, that we need system thinking, we need enterprise architecture, we need service design, we need UX, we need a whole lot of other uh, approaches and, 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 and disciplines. EA is seen as a meta-discipline, uh, but well, some, some would say there's meta-meta uh, on, 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 on top of it, uh, and, and the, the, the uh, sort of performance issues of 95% of or, or, or whatever, or, or the whole turning from inside out to, to outside in, and, and Gartner's concept of outside out. Uh, we, we certainly don't have the, the right as enterprise architects to, to say this is only us. Just as the service designers and the UX people and the performance managers and so on shouldn't have the right to say uh, this, is, this is me, a, a performance management team who, who sets up KPIs might well not be aligned with what the employees want and what the enterprise architects actually see as as, as this is what, what should be. Uh, Seddon has some good examples uh, actually on what goes wrong if, if you sub-optimize on, on, on KPIs with his stories on, on, on the call center. If you only measure how many calls do they take, well, they, that will be the rudest customer service ever because when, when a customer calls, the, the, the uh, service center says, I have no, uh, no, no clue, uh, call someone else, and, and they get their, their bonus. So, so performance management is, is extremely dangerous if, if you don't do it right. And enterprise architects could be the ones who, who based on system thinking, I would say here, uh, 
get, sort of point to, okay, what should be the, the right stuff to, to, to deal with here? Yeah, I think, I think Seddon's interpretation of systems thinking is, is very powerful because he does look at it from the demand. And I think often, you know, if you look at it from any other point of view other than the demand, you end up with a dis different result. Yeah. Uh, and he also has this concept of value demand and failure demand. Very simple ideas. I think back to your point that he doesn't understand IT. I think he deliberately un doesn't understand IT. I think IT hasn't done a lot of the public sector a great service over the last 20 to 30 years, and he's in to sort of try and cut that out. I think he does see the need for IT, but not in the vast quantities that a lot of the suppliers see it, back to the IBM sales stuff. So, for, I mean, how many people have read Seddon stuff here? Okay, two. Well, I'd encourage those of, of you who haven't um, to, to actually read his stuff. It's, it's, it's very compelling. He's quite abrasive as a character, quite challenging. Uh, but the whole demand-driven service design that he puts forward um, and, and the fact that services are fundamentally different from manufacturing, which is where we get lean from, yeah, is actually great. Because I think there's a, and he's pretty, pretty outrageously derogatory about the lean <laughs> tool heads, he calls them. Uh, so there's a lot of spin in this thing, but I think some fundamental beliefs in Seddon's work are very, very powerful and cut to the quick myself. I don't yeah. know, do you? Do you I, I'd agree. How many people here have done any training on systems thinking? So there's still quite a few that haven't. I'd, I'd really recommend you go do it. If I go back nearly a decade now, I was teaching on the technology MBA with the OU. I was doing the strategy course, strategy tutor. And after a year or so of that, I got a, a call. They got a, an opening on the systems thinking module where they needed a tutor for that. I was also thinking, so I spent two years doing the systems thinking side as well, teaching that bit. I tell you, it really makes your head think differently when you start to bring in some of these techniques about looking at the whole system space. At that time, I was still fairly early on in looking at the whole enterprise view as an enterprise architect. You know, big organizations, you might be called an enterprise architect, but you're only working in R&D or you're in the logistics and supply chain space. Yeah? And it's still big enough there. When you start to have to consider the whole system, the ecosystem, we call it enterprise architecture, but who just works in the walls of their enterprise these days? You don't. You work in an ecosystem of partners, it spreads out a lot further. And understanding that ecosystem is really something you can get out from the systems thinking world and the tool sets in it. I still use a lot of the tool sets I picked up then to be able to run good workshops and expand the thinking. So for those that didn't stick your hand up, when you leave here, go away and have a look at some of the systems thinking stuff. I would guess by now there's a ton of videos on YouTube that you can go through from really good <coughs> materials, as, as well as what you might recommend. Okay, so let's, let's move to the next question. Awesome. Yeah, it's uh, Craig Rollison, National Grid. Um, and I certainly think there's a case for systems thinking and storytelling. I think it's sort of left brain, right brain for me. They, there's a case for them both. Um, also, on the storytelling bit, I think there's a need to understand the emotional architecture of the organization, and I think that's what IBM tapped into. So we talk about enterprise architecture, and if I look at the course and the, the training sessions, they're really on the hard side of organization. And I think the emotional side is really important. So if anybody watches uh, television, look at how home base are selling their kitchens. It used to be, you know, we've got some good features here, we've got good taps, we've got a hot tap, we've got dishwashers and stuff. Nowadays, the adverts are all about if you buy this kitchen, guess what? Your relationships will be better. Your in-laws will be better. We'll fix the problem with your cat. We'll everything, that they solve everything. So if you look at what's happening in the, in the world, everybody's now pitching to the emotional side. They're right away from the functional side, more into the, the emotional side of organization. So I think there is a sense of needing to get in touch with that when we're trying to sell. The architecture always makes sense for me. It's, it's that harder. What's the emotional architecture of the organization? Very definitely. certainly agree with that. Uh, it's about understanding how to put your story. You, you don't go all emotion, but you want to balance. You need to understand where the emotions are going to come from, from the people you're talking with, and to be able to relate to emotional responses. So it is a balance of the logical and the emotional side. Uh, there's a good book by Chip and Dan Heath on change, and it's about a 260, 270-page book. 
of which somewhere around page 220, the whole book is explained on one page. The logical brain is the rider on the elephant, telling the elephant where to go. For a well-trained elephant, the logical brain can control everything. The elephant is the emotional side. And when the elephant gets spooked, the elephant's going where it wants, and the logical brain is up for a ride. And the only third part of the story is, if you're trying to get the elephant through the forest, once the elephant is spooked, about the only thing you can do is clear a few trees out of his way, so he's going to take the easiest path through it. So when I talk about storytelling, you want to think, what's the logical side for the people looking at that? What's the emotional side? And which trees are you going to knock down for them so it's an easy path to follow once you've spooked the elephant? I do say that to people. Spook the elephant. Kick the emotional side a little bit. Get them thinking where they want to go. Yeah. Enterprise architecture is never going to improve your sex life. It may get you a promotion if you can do the right thing. It may help the organization do something. But there are plenty of emotional triggers and emotional relationships you can use with people. Putting themselves into a situation where they can recollect a good thing happening as a result of doing the right steps and then tell them these are the right steps now, they'll want the same sort of outcome. You're triggering the emotional response. Have you got a good story around emotional architecture? Not really. Um, <laughs> I, I well, guess I guess yeah, <laughs> that's a challenge, uh, but I see the need. I, I see it all the time. Um, I um, I win, a, win the practice, and I I and I interview for the left and right brain, the the, the thinking side and the emotional side. Because I but I do say if you haven't got the emotional side, then it makes the other side really really difficult. So I always look for the emotional side first. So let's let's take it a step further. How do you how do you balance teams when it comes to emotional? architecture, because it isn't just about individuals. What does good emotional architecture look like in a team? It, it just depends on the situation and the stakeholders and, I mean, I guess the bigger the project and the program, the bigger the personalities and the characters that need to be involved and the stronger you need to be um, emotionally with some of these things. Um, so it is about looking at the situation and who what's the right team to put on in this situation. Sometimes you might have really visionary, clear you know, leaders and sponsors that really know what they want. They get enterprise architecture and they invite you into it, and that's great. Some, what, what's all this about? And so you, maybe you've got to look at what are the other ways that you, going back to the storytelling, what are the ways that you engage them in that? So how far are we from saying that I need to learn modeling to explain the past or the current. And I need to learn emotional manipulation to make the future happen. My future. Enterprise architecture future, right? But it is emotional manipulation that we're talking about, isn't it? You use a very emotive word there. Yeah? And that, that is a part of putting together. I could use it um, as emotional influencing. And now it sounds a little less emotive, perhaps a little more clinical. Uh, is the dark side emotional manipulation and the light side is emotional influencing? There's not really much difference there. Uh, you'll get caught out if it comes across as being too manipulative instead of being authentic in terms of you're actually trying to help people relate to what the situation is and get the message across. But when you can wrap uh, your message in a story and use a little emotion there to help people relate to it, that's good. If you're thinking, I'm going to go into marketing and I'm going to really use the marketing techniques and all the exact words, you're probably going to be running for American president somewhere along the way instead. <laughs> yeah. um, it's, it is a fine line to draw between the two, and it's about using the technique to help the audience, the, the people you want to influence, really understand the situation and to give them a little bit of a gentle nudge in the right direction, perhaps but I try and avoid moving into manipulation. That's, that's moving a little bit too close to the dark side. Use a better word for it, influencing skills. If you want to learn more about the influencing skills, grab the books by a guy called Caldini, professor in the US who writes on influencing. He has a team of students who just do influencing experiments. Books are fantastic, and the half a dozen principles he's got there Read through those and, and you'll see what sort of just very simple techniques you can use that touch on that emotional side as well, some evidence behind it, but not manipulatively. So talk about the dark side, light side, because <laughs> I'm confused. Okay. Um, 
how far do you go with the use of emotion to manipulate people to make a decision? Yeah? Mm -hmm. And the use of language. Certain words and terms that kick off an emotional response. If you're in the UK at the moment, you're being manipulated every day by one of two sides who are trying to get you to put the cross in this box or this box. Are they spending their time giving us the logical facts about exactly how much money we're going to get out of the EU compared to what we put in? Or the plans for the future? Where it's going? Nowhere near as much as we're being given the emotional wording around whether immigration is good or bad. It's a very emotive story now. And I think you would see in probably 50% of the different interviews you get, the dark side probably being used of triggering people's negative emotions to go down a particular route. And it is a fine line between the two of using it to manipulate people to an end goal, as opposed to help communicate a message that allows them to make a decision. And I'm all for using emotion and storytelling to help educate an audience so that they can make an informed decision and they understand why they've made that decision. Mm. But the same techniques can be pushed further to take you to what I would say, the dark side, of trying to manipulate people. But they say that, yeah. the, that, that people are motivated doubly to move away from something they don't want or something they fear yep. than uh, towards something. Fear is a much stronger emotive motivator. Yeah. Yes. So you're saying that's the dark side? <sighs> the IBM. The, the IBM, IBM one. Example. Yeah. It, it can be used, fear as a motivator, very much. You don't want to pick the wrong technology choice here. You'll be stuck with it for years. Um, it will cost you a lot of long time. It is, fear is constantly used, whether it is any form of our sales process, uh, from vendors and internally. It, it is a conscious choice, and if you sign up for chartered engineering principles and things like that, you take the right conscious choice as to how far you use the techniques to influence people. And do the but right to thing. me, the dark side is a line somewhere where you, where you're you're moving into a space where you're telling lies or you're manipulating the th the truth. Not so much that you're preventing somebody from running out into the road to get themselves run over. It's I would say it's very easy to not tell a single lie, but to kick just the right emotive messages and avoid the words that might give them the positive side on it. Yes, and we are seeing that every day in yeah. the, the news well, items. The Brexit campaign and Donald Trump as well <laughs> seem to be pretty good yeah. at it. Mm. Um, so, yeah. Sorry. Have Sorry. A thought. I don't know if there's, oh, there's one there and then we'll come to you. Yeah. Just a storytelling question here. My name is Jerry Maloney from the NTMA. Just, what happens if the hero is being portrayed as the villain? Which is exactly what's happening to me. Uh, it's actually quite interesting how you can turn heroes into villains and back again. Uh, one of the key characters in storytelling actually comes from uh, work from a guy called Vladimir Pop. Uh, he looked at fairy tales and the false hero in the story and where the villain turns into the hero because everybody was rooting for the wrong person all along and then you can twist the story around and you, you don't run around after saying I told you so uh, but, but you can twist a story quite clearly where you're the villain and it may well be I don't know your situation, but let's say you're an enterprise architect who's been set up basically to do the right thing, but you're now costing the organization a lot of money and getting no output because of all the projects who are just getting on with the stuff they want and won't abide by governance, etc. It's a fairly common story going down that line. What you need to find in a story like that is how you take the villain to the point where the organization finally realizes the value that they're actually getting from them. You need something that is that pivot point the, that in the story, everybody suddenly realizes, ah, that's where we were going wrong with it. And the, the realization for the hero. There, there are whole story models around that sort of direction. It takes some careful building to be able to do that flip in a story and to think about how to put it in place. But it is very doable, certainly, that you can turn both an individual's perception around and an organization's perception around by looking instead at what the people are seeing is wrong, is that's making them a villain. So you've got to look at what, what the opposite is. If you're the villain, who's the hero? Why do people like the hero? What is the hero giving to them that you're not? You know, why do they think that hero's direction is the one they want, as opposed to your direction? So now you have to work out how to flip the story that what you're giving them 
is the thing they actually want. And then the other guy, oh, they're the false hero. We've been conned. That's not the way we should be doing this thing. You know, I hear you're a bit of a victim at the moment. I, it's a bit of force, and I'd be correct of force. Um, and I'm putting the function in, and everyone is thinking you're taking my job over. Or right. You're interfering with my role. Uh -huh. It's just it's a lot more complicated than it needs to be. So mm -hmm. Nothing to do with the technology or the process, it's to do with the emotion side. Mm -hmm. And I have to work, I'm surely worrying about how I tell my story more than I'm worrying about what story I'm telling. Um, it's about manipulation of words more than it is uh, about what I'm doing. Um, it's just harder than I expected. Mm. What you may need to think about is how to tell the people you're in conflict with a story that makes them the hero. You're not the hero in the story, potentially. You're just the storyteller. And they're actually the hero in the story. And if you line them up the right way, they're going to win. So what's the villain that they could be against? Instead of feeling that you're the villain in the story, allow them to pivot around it and come together so that potentially they're collaborating far more with you. You're the helper that's helping them as the hero to get the job done. And find supporters, because if you get isolated to a point where you're all alone and someone's going to kill you, then that's a Greek tragedy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that too. Uh, we had a, is that a term for part through Toga? <laughs> yeah, it's a very good time. It creates a reaction, an emotional Toga F10. <laughs> it changes the energy. Over to you, sir. Can I, um, can I mention something that picks up on the dark side, light side yes, things? Um, I, I'm Martin Tate. I'm an independent uh, consultant. And when I'm working with IT managers, particularly ones who've come from a, a technical background, who like fixing stuff and getting stuff working. They sometimes say, well, I don't do politics. And some of the things that you're talking about, the complaint would be, you know, oh, it's politics, what can you do? And I tend to encourage them to regard actually politics as an environment. And of course, you can't control the environment, but you can control your reaction to it. And to say, I don't do politics, is a bit like saying, I don't do the weather. The weather yeah. exists. If you don't do the weather, you never wear a coat and you never carry a brolly, which means you get cold and wet. Yeah. So you can't make a choice not to do the weather. You can choose whether to respond to it. And the reframing that I encourage which gets people away from politics is bad and dark side and here uh, and so on. Um, it's a bit like the training that soldiers get when they are being trained for, for jungle warfare. And they have to change their attitude so they stop seeing the jungle as another enemy. You have to see the jungle as your mother. It provides things, it provides cover. It provides food, it provides resources, and so on. So you have to change your attitude to the jungle in order to operate successfully within the jungle. Mm. And if you treat organizational politics in that way, then you've got a better chance of reframing your own approach to it. And if you have a reframed approach to it, you are more likely to be successful it's tempting to say the word player, but that's a cheap word. But if you don't reframe it, I think inevitably you will be a victim of it. And if that means that something that was sensible and the right thing to do and in the corporate interest has actually not prospered as an idea because of politics, then your failure to get traction actually has been counterproductive. Yeah, no, it's a really mm -hmm. good point. Thank mm. you. It's not even a question, it's a good statement. Anything else? There's some at the back? No. Any other thoughts? Okay. No, no, but if, if I can just yeah. Uh, yeah. supplement there, I, I would say that it's, it's ridiculous if, if people call themselves enterprise architects and, and say, I don't do politics. Mm. They're not enterprise architects. They may be good IT architects who, who, who draw drawings all the time or, or, or whatever, but 
They are not enterprise architects for sure. Yeah, very much so. You may not have anybody reporting into you, but if you're an enterprise architect in an organization, you're a senior leader in that organization. Setting thought leadership, setting direction, and influencing the organization's direction of the future. If you're not influencing it, you're not an enterprise architect. You're a passerby. I think it's interesting talking about politics at the moment in the context of the US elections, where you know, Trump clearly uh, doesn't see any of this stuff. You know, he's on the attack. And I mean, to use your military analogy earlier, I think it's, it's useful sometimes to put it into that frame, where if someone is incredibly aggressive, then you need to work out you know, your own tactics within the politics of that to stop them just completely annihilating you. And uh, it's going to be very interesting to see you know, how Trump gets on and how that, that his, his sort of stance is, is actually voted in or out um, as it goes forward, because we haven't really seen behavior like that on the... In, in a sort of more advanced country for quite a while, but you know, and even with the Brexit, it's getting quite sort of narky, you know, at, at, at sort of the front end of it. So politics, you know, in the wider political sense itself, seems to be becoming quite more sort of fractious. You know, we've, we've, we've broken down a lot of the traditional barriers and boundaries, and I think that can be related back to organisations. I've just come out of a client that was appallingly badly led, and I'm obviously telling you it is, uh, for about the last four or five years. And the um, politics, you know, with a big P in that organization were rife. So a good organization perhaps is going to allow people to flourish and survive and grow much more, you know, usefully than one that's really difficult politically. And in a way, we all have individual choices. If you find yourself in an organization that is so political, it's unsustainable and you're finding yourself being attacked, then one of the easiest things to do is go and find another organisation to join, because there's plenty of good ones out there. Yes? Uh, I have worked for organisations where it was management by abdication and people yes. wouldn't take responsibility. And you can sometimes turn that to your advantage, um, in the sense that sometimes you need senior management to lead, to follow, or to get out of the way. Now, if they get out of the way, because they're going to blame you if it goes wrong, but you concentrate on doing the right thing and making certain it doesn't go wrong, it's a form of leadership. You would rather not have to do it, but you can, t you can actually sometimes use that management vacuum to your advantage. Have we uh, time for one or two more thoughts or questions or whatever? Yes, one here and one there. Let's be the last two. Uh, hello, I'm uh, Julian Goodbarn. I work for Computer Centre, working on the uh, Foreign Office contract. Um, I wouldn't see myself as particularly creative. I wondered if you've got any ideas uh, as uh, for inspiration for storytelling. And you also mentioned about uh, story modelling, and I wondered if you could expand on that. Okay, definitely. Uh, I've been doing training courses on how to do the storytelling for the materials I've put together for a good few years in the Microsoft world until one of the guys I'd trained turned around and said, you ought to write a book on this. I said, no. He bugged me the next month and the month after that. And then another colleague of ours uh, said, well, I'd help with the design of the book. So that's Nick Malik and Mark West. And the book was released a few years ago. It's called Stories That Move Mountains. It's now in seven languages. Chinese came out earlier this year. So go search for that. And it's not a big theoretical book of a treatise and where to go. It's a framework that's got all the different bits you think. It's written by two enterprise architects, so it's going to have a framework in it, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's never going to be as famous as our most famous framework. I'm sure of that one. But what I tried to put together in that was the, the different things you need to think about so you can follow a process. And also very quickly look at the framework and say, well, yeah, I've already got this, 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 and this. This is the bit I'm missing. So you, you know where to drill in. And then all the way through the book is just full of the techniques to use. So you can just flip to a page, go through and say, OK, this technique can solve this bit of the problem. And it's got the different story styles in there. It's based on a stack of books about this high off the floor that I've got sitting at home. Went all the way through and said, OK, we need this little bit and this little bit to put it together. And in the framework itself, the top row is your content, your why, your what, your how, and your what ifs and breaking your message down into those so you understand them and then recomposing them together. Because in a story arc like this, your why is your motivation for the hero's journey and potentially what the villain's doing. Your what 
That's your character and content in the story. And the how, well, that's the journey. The step-by-step -step journey you're going to go through, the what if, the options along the way. So it, it helps you put those together. The second row is all about the audience. So un really understanding what your audience has got to think about if you're going to get them to make a decision or to learn. So you can map your content to the audience's needs and really filter it because we send far too much in our presentations and our stories. So you've got to filter it right down so you filter it to be relevant. The third row is then the story itself. The story structure, the selection of the characters, what the sense of urgency is. Because there's no point doing any of this if they don't walk out of the room saying, I'm going to do something now. The last thing you want is to tell the story, put your pitch together, and then they come back a couple of months later and find it in the in-tray. You know, it's about how to get action with it. And then the last row is how to tell it. The visual design and the putting together. So it's content, audience, story, tell, cast. As a framework, go grab a copy. <laughs> and that will take you through a lot of what you're asking for. And it includes the different styles of story. It's a starting point as well. If you find there's bits in there that you like, look up, we reference all the other really good materials you can pick up online. Uh, and whilst you can, go get the book. If you just go and search for Sykes and Channel and Nine, you'll find one of my one hour slots from a couple of years ago that covers most of the materials I did for an audience in New Zealand. Um, and you'll find it's on the Microsoft Channel Nine site. Could you repeat the title? Stories That Move Mountains. Thank you. We had one last thing at the back. And then, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, John Smith, National Grid. Uh, just wondering, most stories we tell are from past experience. Is it possible to tell a coherent story based on the present or the future state of what you wish to describe? Very much so. Very much so. Uh, we do it all the time when we're telling the stories about where a program is going to go. Uh, one of my architects right now is telling the stories of what the experience is going to be like in our new headquarters building. They only laid the concrete for the foundations a couple of months ago. So we're still 18 months away from being able to walk into it. But it's created the visual of this is the experience. When you walk in the building, this is what it's going to feel like on the first day when you go in there. How the handheld app will help you with various services around the building. What the check-in process will be like for visitors. So we're telling the story, and we tell the story there, of a day in the life. But we can also tell the story of how we're going to get from here to that. We've got different versions of stories. If it's for the program board, we've got the transition story. So the various proof points we're going to go through over the next 18 months to prove the different bits of technology and how we're going to try them now. And we, we talk about that as a journey. And the challenges. So it's all about the challenge to it. There's going to be lots of things that could get in the way to get into that final point. But the vision we want to give them is standing on what we might think of as the deck. The first floor has got a library on it that looks down onto the main atrium where people will come in. So imagine you're standing on the deck. Day one, we've opened the triangle. The first members of staff are coming in the door. What is it going to feel like? What experience will they have? So we hit the emotional side of coming into a new building with them. But we talk about that, and then we can talk about the journey to get there. But we relate it to current experience. Stories work well when you can then relate it back. So we start out with, do you remember the, time, the first time you walked into a building that you thought this was absolutely amazing? This is a place you wanted to work, you wanted to be in? So we set that mood, that expectation, so we're going to be. And then we can talk them back to, well, this is what we're building. Yeah, very relevant. Great. So thank you all very much. I'm going to start to wrap up now. I might even get the microphone back to be able to. Thank you. Thank you, Igor, for running around with it. Um, so, um, Martin, your book, Stories That Make Mountains. Um, Stories That Move Mountains. Sorry, Move Mountains. Got to get the title of that right. Better than making. <laughs> John, have you got one book that you recommend on the systems thinking stuff before we finish? Uh, sh yeah, shameless self plug then. Uh, you better do because you've got your book out there. I bought a copy the other month. It's yeah. very good. Uh, I, it's what is it? Three years or so ago, I published a book, uh, which is basically a collection of papers from from a lot of people all over the world, uh, Sally included. Um, it's called Beyond Alignment, um, and it's well, it's rather heavy. It was written as a textbook for this course I mentioned at the university. So some of the papers are actually from the students who took this course. I, I sort of told them, well, if if you have a, a good enough story or, or paper, 
uh, will publish it, and then I invited a bunch of more senior experts. So, so some 30 chapters or so. So, yeah, I re re recommend okay, that. Okay, thank you. Course. Yeah, and as we went through, I took a few others down. There was obviously John Seddon, he was mentioned, uh, and two of my favorites are Joseph Campbell, Hero with a Thousand Faces, and Sir Patrick Geddes, who was a great visionary in the terms of, if you like, some of the more right brain stuff. So, I hope you've all enjoyed our sort of preamble around storytelling and systems thinking. A lot of people, perhaps, when they came into the room, thought, how on earth does this all relate to EA? I hope you've been enlightened. I'd like to thank Martin and uh, John, obviously, for, for contributing, and also to uh, the IRM guys for letting us use this venue and dovetail it on the back of their conference. I think it's been uh, our second year now, and it's worked pretty well. So, And most of all, thank you all for coming. So great. Thanks very much. <laughs>